Hello? Ah, there you go. A little bit better. A lot better. Huh? You better turn down for a little bit. Oh, hello, everybody. All right, sorry for the delay. Um, we're all here now, though, and, and ready to start the fun. Yeah, I think that hard. We'll, we'll get the audio bugs worked out here. Oh, that's that's way better, way louder. So, uh, hi everybody. My name is Josh Winkler, and I'm gonna try to be the uh, the moderator of this uh, fun debate on Amendment 69, Colorado Care. Um, I think probably most people have heard at least a little bit about it. So, uh, hopefully, people know at least the idea of uh, what the concept is. Uh, we're gonna let Senator Aguilar go first to kind of make the the arguments of why we want to do this. Um, so, uh, Linda Gorman can make the arguments of why we might not want to do this. Um, there's water and some snacks in the back if anybody wants anything. Um, some fruit and stuff. Uh, nice, healthy foods. Thanks, Candy. Uh, thanks to Atlantis for hosting this and CCDC for putting it on. Um, so, to get us moving along, I'm going to pass the mic to uh, Senator Aguilar to make the arguments and the introduction on why we should consider doing this in Colorado. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. And I apologize that I came up Santa Fe. Big mistake. Uh, and uh, what I was told is that we had seven minutes um, for our opening. And so um, is that correct? OK, yep. good. I just want to make sure I had my time right. So I'd like to start the way you start medical grand rounds. And usually start with a patient story. And so I want to tell you about um, when I first met patient BX. She was about 40 years old. She worked as a receptionist. She had diabetes. She did not have insurance. Once a year, I would refuse to fill her prescriptions until she came in for a checkup. At these visits, we would usually find that her diabetes was not in control. She would apologetically ask which of her medications were most important if she could not afford all of them. By the age of 50, she developed kidney failure and needed dialysis. At that point, she qualified for Medicare. She felt weak going to dialysis three days a week, and her workplace would not accommodate her absences. She lost her job, filed for disability, and received SSDI. After exhausting her personal financial resources, she then qualified for Medicaid. Over the following years, she lost a limb to amputation, could never find a prosthetic that worked, and ended up using a wheelchair. She developed heart disease and had heart bypass surgery. And at the age of 62, she died from complications of diabetes, a treatable disease. So Colorado Care Amendment 69 uses Section 1332 of the Affordable Care Act to build and improve on the Affordable Care Act and implement a state-based universal health care system like Medicare for everyone in Colorado. Colorado Care redesigns our current profit-driven and corporate-controlled disease care system into a health care system that provides incentives for improving the health of all Coloradans. Colorado Care increases access to prevention and medically necessary care and controls costs by focusing on the 20% of the population who need the most care and account for over 82% of health care spending. Colorado Care creates a fund by combining existing and future federal and state funding with member contributions. Coloradans are asked to, con are asked to contribute to an income-based premium of 3.33%, and businesses contribute through a payroll contribution of 6.67%. The 3.33 contribution provides every employee with a platinum level health care plan with no deductibles, no co-payments for prevention and primary care. Co-payments must be approved by the board of directors and are required to be waived if they present a barrier to taking care of a disease. The 6.67% employer contribution is a reduction compared to the 13.5% currently spent by business owners who provide health coverage and the medical portion of workers' comp to their employees. The Board of Colorado Care would apply for an 1115 Medicaid waiver and ensure providers are paid equally, regardless of patient funding source. This would help to eliminate financial discrimination against people on Medicaid. The amendment states that Colorado Care must provide Medicaid benefits required by federal law. 
that Colorado Care must continue Medicaid program benefits authorized under Colorado Revised Statutes Articles 4 through 6. These benefits include general medical assistance, services and programs, including FQHCs, our community health centers, long-term care, including home and community-based services, CDAS, and Medicaid buy-in. The health care funds are owned by we, the people of Colorado. We are the shareholders. Our health care fund is controlled by a 21-member board of directors that we, the people, choose. Three members will be elected from each of seven different health regions in our state, and they are accountable to their shareholders, who are us. All board meetings are subject to Colorado Sunshine Law and open to the public. The board must publish a financial audit annually. Because they are elected officials, they will be more available to people than the Medical Services Board or the board of a private insurance company. The goal of the system design is to ensure that everyone contributes to health care based on their ability to pay and to ensure that everyone has access to health care without financial barriers. Simplifying health care administration and doing bulk negotiation for prices will allow us to use the savings to expand coverage to the 350,000 people who are currently uninsured. Focusing on controlling costs by promoting prevention and person-centered care of high-cost patients, whether due to medically complex illnesses, home care needs, or mental illness, will allow us to provide further savings. The residents of Colorado would choose their primary care provider. The primary care provider would determine which medical neighborhoods or integrated health care systems he or she worked with. Specialists could work with all systems. Each practice could design the method they'd like for achieving their goal based on the population that they choose to serve. Some practices might develop areas of specialty or expertise, for example, diabetes or pulmonary disease, care for people with disabilities, natural medications, or promoting alternative delivery models to reach their goals. Colorado Care would encourage providers to innovate on the best method for promoting and maintaining the health of their population recruiting their patient base, promoting patient satisfaction, and controlling costs by preventing unnecessary hospitalizations and emergency room visits. The delivery system for medically complex patients would center on patient-centered medical homes, which can provide cost-effective health management. In fact, in one study, hospital costs were reduced by over 40% using patient-centered medical homes. The keeping Coloradans healthy and out of the hospital would be the best way for Colorado Care to achieve financial success. Colorado Care would allow our state to elegantly, effectively, and efficiently provide for the health of all Coloradans. So that was our little introduction to what, what Colorado Care is. And I saw Glenn Gordon and Tina last night. And I actually apologize. I didn't do a very good job of introducing the, the folks that are debating this. Uh, I think many people know Senator Aguilar, uh, Dr. Senator Aguilar, so kind of doctor background and uh, legislative background. And, and Linda Gorman runs the Independence Oh, no, or, no, no. No, no. Well, works for the Independence Institute. <laughs> okay. uh, I'll, I'll let her do a better introduction than I do. I'm, a, I'm an economist and I study healthcare policy for the Independence Institute, which is um, a 501c3 nonpartisan free market think tank. So we uh, take money from anybody but government, basically. Okay. Um, if it were what Senator Aguilar says, I would vote for it, all right? The problem is, is that what we are voting on is a specific amendment with specific language. And that language doesn't promise any of the things that she hopes will occur. And in fact, when we see this language operating in other countries, specifically Canada, the results are nothing like um, people hope they would be. So I want, want to start with um, asking you to think about the fact that this is okay. Um, healthcare requires that other people do it for you. Um, if you need healthcare, you usually need expertise from somebody else. You need drugs, you need devices, you need home care, whatever you need. And those people are not going to do it unless they have a working environment that they like and they feel like they're getting paid what they need to be paid. So a toxic working environment and very high taxes are going to drive people away from healthcare. And unfortunately, a toxic working environment and very high taxes is what amendment 69 creates. 
Um, so when free people can innovate and take their money and decide how they're going to get their health care, you get programs like CDAS, which has been really effective, but the state still doesn't like it, which for reasons which remain outside of my understanding. Um, so there's all kinds of ways we can subsidize health care for people who need it. There are all kinds of ways we can design insurance plans and so forth. Amendment 69 picks one of those ways, and that's a command and control system that puts one board of 21 people in charge of your health care. And the way it's in charge of your health care is that it sets the prices for every single health care service by Colorado licensed health care providers in the state. It sets all those prices. It doesn't matter who pays. So if you're hiring somebody who's a nurse, you have to pay what Colorado Care says, no matter whether that person will work for that wage or not. To pay for it, it imposes taxes. These aren't premiums, these are taxes. You don't go to jail if you don't pay your premiums. You do go to jail if you don't pay your taxes. There's a 10% payroll tax. If you work and you're on Medicaid or Medicare, and you work part-time, you will pay the 10% payroll tax. Now they'll say, well, your employer pays part of it, and you pay part of it. Look, you end up paying either to reduce wages, reduce working hours, or whatever. Payroll taxes are paid by income. The second thing it does is it imposes a 10% income tax, in addition to the existing state income tax, which would give Colorado an income tax rate of 14.63% which is the highest in the United States. And that income tax rate is going to be paid by every single person, no matter how much money they make. It's a tax on royalties, dividends, interest, retirement income, everything. How many people do you think are going to stick around in this kind of toxic tax environment, the toxic working environment, to provide health care in Colorado? Not very many. People can move, and they do. Now let's talk about the kind of health care this board is likely to provide. This is not like any kind of government thing you've ever seen before. It is um, it outside of normal Colorado law. It sets its own elections. It decides who's going to be able to run. You cannot recall the people on the board. Um, and the voters can be anybody who says they're a resident of Colorado who's over 18. You don't need U.S. citizenship. You don't need to follow any voting residential residence laws. You just have to be here and say, I'm 18, I want to vote. And you can't. Nobody knows how the board is going to handle elections. They're exempt from the fair election laws in Colorado, which means they can decide to hold an election on top of Mount Evans tomorrow at 12.01 a.m. And whoever shows up controls the election. This is just flat not good government. Um, regardless of the health care thing, we're giving this entity control without any responsibility, no accountability at all. Then the board is going to decide on what treatments are allowed. The amendment says it has to look at per capita health care costs and it has to control them. That means that if somebody learned how to cure diabetes tomorrow and it was more effective or more expensive than sticking people with needles all the time, the board would have a reason in the legal language of the amendment to not allow people to get that treatment because it's too much spending. This is really bad news for people who are seriously ill or who need a lot of care because in systems like this, the politicians who run it always gravitate toward needy and healthy voters and they just say, oh, the few people who need a lot of care are too expensive. We see it in England, we see it in Canada. Let them sit on waiting lists, let them not have access to drugs, basically let them die. Um, so this is not a good setup for health care either. Um, because real accountability for any organization requires real choice. And real choice means that you can take your health care dollars, and if you're not getting good care, you can go somewhere else. Notice that in the amendment they say you can pick your primary care provider. They don't say that primary care provider has to be a physician. And they don't say you have any choice of treatments, specialists, the hospital you go to, or anything else. The board will decide all that based on how much value they think you have to them. Um, so, you know, let's talk about the taxes. The taxes are huge. Um, to give you an idea, we're already seeing out migration from California, New York, Illinois, which have far lower state taxes than 14.63% here. Colorado Care doesn't cover everybody. It covers, it will pay for people who are not on a federal health care program. That would be, if you're on Medicare or Medicaid, you'll pay. 
and people who do not have private insurance. If you want to get care out of the state, the chances are you're going to have to carry some sort of private insurance. And so Colorado Care isn't necessarily going to pay for care out of state with little provisions of emergency care for the So what you're voting for when you vote for this amendment, it may be a system that's tremendous will magically arise, but the, the higher likelihood is that you're going to get the Canadian system, where you have long waits for care, you have very difficult time finding doctors, it's very wasteful, and it's run by a governing body that's totally unaccountable. Okay. So I, I think we hear two uh, yeah, d differing opinions. So they, they start the, the conversation like, well, I'm glad we had a little extra time at the beginning to really lay out both sides of the, the coin. Um, so the next section we're going to go into is a prepared uh, start with the feedback. I, I think we're just in a small room here, so hopefully that isn't too bad for you guys. Uh, we have a prepared question and answer section that were some combined questions from a bunch of different disability groups put together. Kind of some of the broad disability kind of questions that I think haven't really come up in a lot of other discussions around this particular amendment. Um, so the, the first one is, what assurances would there be that the voices of people with disabilities will be heard since it's an elected board? Um, just for a little background, currently the Medicaid board has a slot on it for a person with a disability or a family member of a person with a disability, where this board would be strictly elected and may or may not include that. So we'll sort of send it out again. Thank you. I do want to say that that was my bill to put a person with disabilities on the Board of the Medical Services Board. There are no designated seats for anyone on the elected Board of Directors, and that would include people with disabilities. There's no dedicated, I mean, when I talk to doctors, I get how many doctors will be on the board. When I talk to nurses, I get how many nurses will be on the board, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Medical Services Board is um, actually established in CRS 25.5 Part 3, which is not directly affected by the language in Amendment 69. So it's Part 4, 5, and 6 that are guaranteed under Amendment 69. Um, so it would most likely be the elected board of directors that would set up the process and determine if they want to continue a Medical Services Board. Now, because they are elected, as I mentioned before, they are significantly more available to the people than um, either the Medical Services Board or an insurance company's board. And again, this board will hold public meetings. It will be campaigning for office. And it will be otherwise engaging with the public. And this is a more significant way to ensure that they are open to input and feedback. Uh, there are no guarantees with this whatsoever. Um, it will look like Canada, where if you're very ill, you probably won't get care because it's too expensive. People talk about the representation. As it is now in the Colorado House, each representative represents about 86,000 people. For this board, with 21 people representing the entire state, it's more like a quarter of a million. So what this does is this reduces your chance of having anybody represent your rights. Um, and the other thing is, of course, is that there is no election law that governs this thing, so you have no idea how the elections are going to be set up, who is going to be eligible to support them or not. Um, and it's a huge chance for crony capitalism here, I might, might point out, because there's no accountability. There's a budget of maybe 30 million, or billion, let's say, too many zeros, right? Billion, huge amounts of money. And so this is just asking for corruption and waste as well. Sorry, I was getting Marcus seconds to try to figure out the uh, the feedback we're getting. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. Oh, don't wait on me. <laughs> that, that, that's better. Whatever you just did is better. Uh, so our next question is, uh, and uh, Senator Aguilar alluded to this a little bit earlier, but um, in, in the the language of the amendment, it talks about some of the guaranteed uh, services that will be in there. And that Medicaid, the required services under Medicaid would be uh, continued. Uh, but specifically, how will long term care work with Colorado Care, uh, including the 1915C waivers, the uh, optional state plan benefits, and then how will OMSA be enforced to make sure people aren't just forced into institutions? Thank you, um, Josh. So, as I did mention, the amendment specifically references CRS 25.5 Article 6, and this is a statute that covers long-term services and support. CDOT 
all other home and community based caregivers waiver services and so benefits currently available under these programs must be maintained. Um, the um, Olmstead Act is a federal law and requirement and would need to continue. So if you look at laws, if something is federal, it trumps anything state and state has to follow it. So there would be a requirement that we continue to comply with Olmstead. And, um, and if you look at costs, as many of you know, home-based care in many cases is less expensive than institutional placement. And additionally, there is um, often a, um, an unmeasurable portion, which is called consumer patient satisfaction, life satisfaction, less depression, more happiness and care. And so um, I don't perceive a incentive to create more institutional care. Thank you, sir. Again, there's no guarantees. It's simply federal law has to be followed by um, Colorado Care. Beyond that, Colorado Care can pretty much do what it wants. It has to. It's not clear to, to what extent it has to follow state statutes. And any in any case, state statutes can be changed. This thing is going into the Constitution, which is what I tell people who are worried about having their retirement benefits taxed. They simply say, "Well, you have an exemption in the state statutes. The tax is in the Constitution. When the state gets." Crunch for money, which it will, because it has to give a third of its budget to Colorado Care by the constitutional amendment. It's likely the statutes will be changed. So again, there's no guarantee to this at all. I'm not sure why that's got way worse. We might just start yelling here in a minute. Well, that is right. Maybe may we just talk really loud. That'll be better. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'll, I'll probably have the softest voice, so I'll try my best. Um, some of these questions made more sense before we started getting answers, so I'll try to modify it slightly as I go. Um, as was mentioned earlier, the Medical Services Board isn't necessarily eliminated through Colorado Care. Um, another program that's required under the federal regs right now in Medicaid is EPSDT, which is Early Periodic Screening, Diagnostics, and Treatment. Um, I always want to say testing, but treatment. And so, so the question is, how would that be continue to be enforced if the Medical Services Board were to go away? Would this governing body be the ones who would enforce that? So. Um the amendment specifically says that Colorado Care will cover all benefits required by federal law. And EPSDT, as Josh noted, what is required by federal law. And so unless the feds change their law, EPSDT would be covered. Um, it's anticipated, generally CMS um, enforces these by taking complaints if the state isn't doing something. And again, because we'd be applying for a waiver from CMS, we would need to require, uh, comply with waiver requirements by CMS. So, in other words, they would be ensuring that the funds are being used the way they are required to be used, or they take the funds away. I do want to take issue with um, the statement that the only thing guaranteed is what's required by federal law. And if you got the handout, the first lines here in the first bold section are what's actually in the amendment. And so the amendment does there specifically refer to Articles 426 of Title 25.5, Colorado Revised Statutes. Now, I think an argument can be made, does this tie us to 2016 Colorado Revised Statutes? Or if the legislature changes it in the future, are we then tied to future changes in Colorado statutes? And I know there are probably lawyers here who have a better sense of that. At a minimum, it would guarantee that what is currently in the statute are required. So there is no guessing there about, I was going to make a copy of it, but it's like 60 pages of what's required right now. And according to the amendment itself, those need to be upheld. And so I, um, 
there is no guessing on that. What I would agree that there might be dispute about is whether it's tied just to the 2016 statute when it was passed, or whether in the future you could continue to lobby the legislature to make changes in those statutes, which would then impose changes onto Colorado care. Um, there's a fairly long history of legal theory that suggests that current legislatures can't bind future legislatures. We have no idea how this is going to play out if you have a constitutional amendment that tries to bind future le legislatures with current law. It's an, just an unknown area. Um, something to think about is who's going to enforce all of this. Um, you know, uh, to give you an example, some hospitals are required to do certain things. We all know they don't necessarily do certain things. It matters which hospital it is, whether or not it gets enforced. Um, what you have here is one giant um, entity that's going to provide your health care. And if you're over here on the side yelling about something particular, do you think you're going to be able to get its attention? That's the question. That's going to lead to. Uh, Sorry, yeah. Well, actually, I I'll, 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 I'll go ahead and jump to the next. Go ahead, to, I'll skip on <laughs> my list. Are we, can we our yeah, we, at the end? yeah, after the kind of general QA, we have an like audience okay. QA. Thanks, Mark, for reminding me of that. that the next question I'll jump to, and I'll actually go to you first, uh, Linda. Uh, the way that you read the language, who will hear complaints and how will the appeal process work? Now there's a pretty clear mm -hmm. level of appeal that you go through, whether it's private insurance or Medicaid. It, how, how do you understand this would work under Colorado Care? The amendment requires that they have an ombudsman. Um, my response to that always, if a system needs that, then you've got a problem because the VA has lots and lots of patient advocates running around, doesn't do anything to change the actual VA care. Um, to me, the only important choice is whether you can take your money that's been allocated for your care and go somewhere else if you get lousy care. That's the only way to make any system pay attention. Um, and that's not in this, unless the board decides that maybe it wants to run Colorado Healthcare that way, but I would say the chances are low. So. Um, First, let me address what's in the amendment specifically. As um, Ms. Gorman stated, it does specify that there is um, that the board is required to provide funds to the Commissioner of Insurance for the operation of ombudsman offices, one for beneficiaries and one for providers. It also is written to ensure that all Coloradans are given full right of appeal within our judicial system. Here's the language from the amendment again. Establish an appeals procedure that allows beneficiaries and providers to challenge coverage and payment decisions. Final action on an appeal shall be subject to judicial review according to Colorado law and the Colorado rules of civil and appellate procedure for the review of final agency actions. So this is a similar procedure to what exists right now under Colorado Medicaid. In terms of who will enforce this, the um, the existence of Colorado Care is contingent on receiving a waiver from the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And so um, as happens with other things we get from CMS, we have to show that we're being compliant with the terms of the agreement. And so in addition to consumers and the transparency and accessibility of the information from Colorado Care, um, there is also the oversight by the federal government in the form of the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Are you going to go back to this question? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to move next. Uh, I, I jumped ahead there because uh, like uh, uh, Lynn Gorman's comments. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so my next, actually, next two questions are kind of around the the way this is going to be paid for. Um, so, how will payments work? For and I'll, I feel bad that I went to first year to you, so I'll go to so Ms. Gorman again. Um, how will folks who are on SSI or SSDI or other you know, low income programs, will the premiums and taxes be assessed? A lot of those folks don't currently file taxes because they don't have enough in earnings to file taxes. Um, so, how will that work? Well, if you don't file, you obviously won't pay the income tax. But if you work, you will pay the payroll tax. 
so your costs instantly go up by 10%. And these are taxes, these are not premiums, sorry. That's being difficult. Um, something to think about with respect to the legality. Um, this is the kind of weasel wording that's in this amendment, you know, all judicial review procedures. Well, it turns out, according to a legal opinion given to the Colorado Health Foundation, that um, this entity is probably covered under Colorado state immunity laws, so it's immune from tort lawsuits. So you cannot sue it for not providing you with care because it doesn't give you any specific right to care. It says in the amendment it's not health insurance. So if it decides no, you can you know waste your time on all the appeals you want. If it decides no, you're stuck. So um, there are no taxes on SSI or SSDI, as these have a federal exemption on our 1040 form. If there is no other source of income, there are no other premium taxes collected. People who are self-employed and who are paying themselves income will pay the 3.33 and 6.67% premiums on this income. If they are not making any income, so their business is losing money, they will not be asked to pay any premium. If their income is low and they are currently on Medicaid, they will likely see little change except for better access to care due to less financial discrimination. Um, the next one is kind of double question that they don't totally go together, but they kind of do. Um, and, and this is uh, briefly touched on earlier, and I'm going to do the same for Senator Aguilar. Uh, how will services out of state be paid for? And in the amendment, it says somebody would have to live in Colorado for one year before they could gain access. How would that work for somebody? That, currently, if you're uh, on, on Medicaid, the day you come into the state, you can get services. So how would that work for those folks? Okay. So with respect to services performed out of state, so Amendment 69 does require the board, as Linda mentioned, Ms. Gorman, to establish policies and procedures for payment of services for beneficiaries traveling out of state. And the language in the amendment actually is, if you look at the page that describes the benefits, they are set there to mirror the benefits that are required under the Affordable Care Act. And, um, and in order for the program to move forward, we need to get the waiver for the Affordable Care Act. And so one of the requirements for the waiver is that you provide at least the same level of benefits to at least the same number of people for, um, for not an increase in cost for those people, and then that you can show that this plan is actuarially sound. And so just like right now, your insurance is required to pay for different kinds of benefits. If we don't have it in the state, then they would be required to pay for it out of state. That same requirement would be placed onto Colorado Care. That if it's a service we do not have in this state, it has to be paid for where it can be given. Um, your second question had to do oh, with people who move into the state. Um, so, as I mentioned before, Colorado Care also applies for an 1115 or Medicaid waiver. And there are certain federal laws and rules around Medicaid, one of which is that when people come into the state, they need to be immediately qualified and able to receive services. And so Colorado Care would be required to comply with that law. The amendment simply says that it has to make arrangements to provide services for people who are temporarily out of the state. Um, that's all it says. It, it's, it's absolutely silent on whether if you need a specific treatment that's only available in Boston on whether it will pay for it. And none of the Obamacare categories of benefits under the essential health care benefits requires that an insurer pay for care out of the state. It's nothing that detailed. You don't have a right to any specific treatment under this amendment. If you're on Medicaid, you're protected by federal requirements. But still in all, you may want a particular treatment, but that doesn't mean a physician out of state will take you for those Medicaid rates. Right? And if you're in state, don't forget Colorado Care is controlling the price that's offered to everybody. So if you're a patient that takes a long time to, to talk to, or you, you know, just your mobility is impaired or something, why should a physician who needs to keep billing in order to keep his rates of payment up, because they'll probably pay low, prefer you over someone else. Chances are you'll be at the end of the waiting list. So a follow-up that it was on my original list, but has come up a couple times now. This would be an 1115 waiver. 
unlike currently when the state has an 1115 waiver, it's usually for a select population, a select service group. This would be a super Love. waiver that would replace and do away with all existing 1915C waivers and the state plan, correct? So um, if any of you have been following uh, what's happening nationally with Medicaid, Oregon, I think, did a global waiver, uh, a super waiver, as Josh said, 1115. And so the, um, the design of that waiver, and I don't know what it is for Oregon, um, the design of the waiver for Colorado would be to take over the existing programs that are in section four through six. And there are two reasons why we want to do that. The first is because we want to simplify billing for providers so that they don't have to bill differently for people who have Medicaid versus straight Colorado care. Um, and that will help some, uh, decrease administrative costs. The second reason why, and, and I want to use this to talk a little bit about the statement Ms. Gorman made indicating that there would be less uh, that if you that people who took more time would be reimbursed less well than people who took less time. So in our current system, a Medicaid provider gets paid the same no matter what amount of time they see you for. When you talk about a system designed around patient-centered medical homes, there are actually incentives that are given to providers to help them not only spend the time they need to with you, but hire the staff that's needed to provide comprehensive care. Because Colorado Care will be covering your life from birth until death, there is no benefit to delaying you any care right now. Because if we delay you care and you get that complication, you get that fed sore, you get that disseminated infection, whatever the complication is, we'll be paying for that too. There's no avoiding the cost. And so in that kind of a system, the alignment and the incentives are all around who are the people who need the most complex care? How can we be sure we have ideally the best providers caring for them and provide them the support they need? Because if you can do a good job, as I mentioned earlier, helping people who have medically complex needs, you can, you can really help control your costs. Remember, only one in five people account for 82% of the spending. And so I could make a healthy person exercise all I want that's not going to save me nearly as much money as being sure that a person who has high needs, takes a long period of time to see, gets a doctor who's willing to work with them, ideally in the setting of a patient-centered medical home. And so the incentives are very different in a system that looks for paying for everybody's care from birth until death because there is no avoiding costs. You're going to pay for it one way or the other, and basic medical care teaches you that the earlier you pay for things, the sooner you intervene, the less you pay in the long run. Do you have any thoughts on either the waivers or the, the payment structure? Sure. Um, it's, it's a fallacy that um, this thing won't start until all these waivers are approved. In fact, what the amendment says is that the only entity that has the ability to call off Colorado Care is this board. And that's, so if you, if you vote for this and it passes, the board is going to decide whether or not it thinks it's financially reasonable to go forward. Not the federal government, not the state government, just the board. You're in a cushy position. You've got people with the right ideology sitting there. Guess what they're going to decide no matter what. I mean, there's that danger if you vote for it. There is no oversight of what this board does. Let's talk about administrative costs for a moment. Um, administrative costs for an entity that's going to regulate every price in the state is going to be high. Administrative costs for an entity that doesn't have to follow state personnel laws that can pay its, its um, uh, people anything it wishes are going to be high. There's no pressure for it to economize. And um, what we've seen in, in, in places that have similar kinds of care, namely Canada, where everything's integrated, and Britain, where everything's integrated, is that where the resources go are to the worried well voter. They don't go to the very expensive cases because, frankly, it's, it's, e it's cheaper to let very expensive people die than it is to care for them. And only if you make a profit for treating people who are expensive to treat are you willing to do that. 
um, which is one reason the U.S. system, because it's so much, it's so much of it was private until recently, has lower um, blood pressure rates for everybody, has um, better um, disability health in some sense, has fewer disabled people, better treatment of diabetics, and on and on and on. Um, example, I have a friend of mine works at a hospital here. She does wheelchair fitting. She had an intern come in from Britain who was stunned that when you were in the U.S., you actually had a prescription for a wheelchair and you got fitted and you got the chair that you need that fits your body. In Britain, they're told to go to a storage cabinet and rummage through the parts and try to put something together. Cost less, but it's the patients who bear the cost in these kinds of things. Just a real quick follow-up. The 21-member elected board, how is their compensation set? So um, actually all the amendment says about the board is that the compensation, um, that the board may be compensated uh, for their costs and expenses of participating, but it does not set their compensation um, or say what the criteria are for compensating them. Did you just so, ask us a different yeah, question? Yeah, it's not. Uh, no, but uh, I mean, a well, question that she waivers. answered that I didn't, or no? No, no it was around the waivers okay. that kind of went into the... the yeah, they kind of went okay. off, of the, okay. off track. I was so, so they'll set that themselves then, yes. since they're their own governing body? Ah. Ah. The question was, how would the uh, salaries for the board be set? And it would be set in one of their open board meetings. So they decide their own salaries. Yes. And they decide the structure of the organization and the salaries of everybody there, because it's not part of the state government administrative personnel act. So, and they'll also decide their own retirement funding, which if you look at the Colorado Health Exchange was a very, very nice package. You were vested after a year and you had something like 10% return on that retirement plan. So this is not a good structure for um, efficiently using the tax money that they're collecting. Uh, well, access to, to doctors, especially primary care, is a big challenge for a lot of people with disabilities. Will there be any requirements that people, the physicians under Colorado Care, see anyone who requests a visit? Can they turn away anyone at their whim? Will there be requirements they see everyone? What should we have first? So um, the amendment is silent on this topic. However, um, because reimbursements for Medicaid allied beneficiaries are not distinguished from reimbursements for other beneficiaries. The financial reluctance that providers have to treat Medicaid eligible patients will be eliminated. And because there will be an incentive provided for providers who are um, redesigning healthcare to provide patients in their medical homes for medically complex patients, there will be a mechanism to provide enhanced payment for people who are willing to take care of patients who are more complex. I do also want to read the language from the amendment that says. Um, if the board determines that Colorado Care has not received the waivers, exemptions, and agreements from the federal government sufficient for the fiscally sound operation, the board shall shut down operations and return unused funds and notify the governor of the state of Colorado of Colorado Care's inability to function um, and notify the revisor of statutes in writing of the date the operations are shut down. So it specifically says that the board needs to be financially sound, that it needs to have obtained the waivers. And um, in order to obtain the waiver from the Secretary of Health and Human Services, your plan needs to be analyzed by an actuary and shown to be financially sound 10 years out. The biggest difference between the United States and Canada is that the United States spends more than twice as much per person on health care as Canada. And with Colorado Care, while we are projecting some administrative savings, we are not cutting funding down to Canada's level. If Canada's system had funding at the level that we do, they would not have the weights that they have. Your thoughts on access to care through doctors? Um, the question is whether any doctors are going to stay in the state when you start taxing their incomes an additional 10% and you make them work under this enormous complex bureaucracy. And that's what I tried to say with my opening remarks. In order to get health care, you have to have a working environment that people like. And it's innovative people that create better health care. And when you have a bureaucracy running everything, you know, people leave. This bureaucracy looks more like Medicaid than it does Medicare 
the reason being that nobody has any choice. In Medicare, at least you have a choice of different plans. Um, you have you know, some choice of different drug plans and so forth, so you have some choice. This plan, Colorado Care, runs everything unless you're on a federal program or you have private insurance and you can get out of the state. So you're likely to have to keep private insurance under this plan. In terms of access, the discussion always is like somehow everybody will be paid at commercial insurance rates. That's not going to happen, right? Because for one thing, they're going to be um, running a more efficient system and covering anybody who shows up in the state and wants health care. So you're going to have to spread this money over a large number of people who say, do health care tourism into Colorado. Um, it's unlikely that this board will pay commercial carrier rates, in which case you're back at Medicare, Medicaid rates, which are currently below cost. And the only reason people are getting the kind of care and level they're getting on the government programs is the commercial insurers are paying a whole lot more, 200% sometimes of Medicare. And that pays for the capital costs, the new hospital rooms, the imaging equipment, and so forth, which is why when you see hospitals are mostly located in Medicaid, Medicaid Medicare places, they are really struggling um, because government simply doesn't pay enough. It doesn't cover capital costs. It doesn't cover research costs. It doesn't you know, cover enough to make people want to work in healthcare. So the problem is, is that if you pass the system and you have this one cost, you are likely to be destroying the capital base for the healthcare system. It'll be fine for a while. It was fine in Canada for 10 years, and now it's going downhill very rapidly. When people say that U.S. healthcare is more expensive than Canada or whatever, the thing you have to remember is that in those countries, A, they use a different accounting system than we use here. For example, home-based care is counted under health care here. It might be counted under the social budget in those countries. So the accounting systems are very different. The second thing to remember is that they operate under administered prices. And this is getting way into the research weeds, but sometimes the price that the government sets in England, say, doesn't reflect the entire cost of operating a hospital because there's grants off in another part of the budget that they use to subsidize the hospital. Here, the hospitals are on their own. So just leave it at that. You probably don't want to know any more about that topic. But. So a, a couple <laughs> service areas that are really specific to people with disabilities are durable medical equipment and uh, both medical and non-medical transportation. The amendment speaks to the required federal um, Medicaid stuff. The, the Currently, Colorado offers a bit more than what is required under the federal regs. Who will determine what and how much in, in the areas of DME and uh, transportation, both medical and that non, non medical, will be covered? Mm -hmm. So, the amendment does require a continuation of current Colorado medical um, Medicaid statutes and policies. So, if it's currently covered, it would be continued. In terms of future changes, again, that's the issue of uh, will the legislature be able to make changes into those referred to statutes that then are a, um, encumbered on the board of directors? I do also want to say that the plan was actually looked at by an economist, and um, and the rates he used to calculate the cost were paying at about 150% of Medicare. I also want to assure you that doctors are very unhappy with our commercial insurance system. There are some that are happy, but most are not. And in fact, I just learned today that some are being offered contracts at 50% of the Medicare rate, take it or leave it, because we're um, having the insurers have more market power than the providers. And this is why our hospitals are building more and more hospitals, is to try and have more market power than the insurer. And it's a race to the top for cost and bottom for value for the average patient in our state. Um, we do have hundreds of doctors who have endorsed Colorado Care. We are being analyzed by the Colorado Medical Society, and we will be having a pro and con debate at their annual meeting in September, at which point the doctors from our Colorado Medical Society will take a vote. I can tell you that in um, speaking to doctors groups, the loudest opposition comes from the highly paid specialists out of fear. Um, in general, we get a lot of support from primary care providers because the current system is not paying them adequately to provide good care to their patients. Yeah, excuse me. 
Uh, do you have any thoughts on the maintenance and effort requirements in the amendment and what will be continued or, or additional fears on what? It's all up to Colorado can. CARE, right? So they have, to, they can do what, pretty much whatever they want and whatever they can talk the federal government into. Um, in terms of whether physicians support it or not, no, fine. I don't think a lot of physicians understand it yet. Some people will support it anyway. There are some physicians that move to Canada because they love that system. There are far more physicians that move here because they prefer this system to the Canadian one. Um, I just lost my train of thought. It's a terrible thing to do in a debate. But anyway, um, so we'll leave it at that. Topic. <laughs> so one, one last question that wasn't on my list, but I just uh, popped in my head that the federal government, speaking of the negotiations, the federal government, the federal government will only negotiate with one agency in each state. Currently in Colorado, that's the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing. So even when a lot of the DD programs lived over at Department of Human Services, Department of Human Services could not call CMS and ask a question. Who will be the single state agency under Colorado Care? Mm -hmm. So the um, obviously this is part of the waiver. So the board will ask that the agency be Colorado Care, and if they refuse, there may still need to be a liaison through the um, executive chambers. Okay. But, I mean, the amendment says you, the state will make arrangements to contract with, right, with Colorado Care if the feds say no. Right. So it's again, who knows? I did remember my thought though, so I'll use my last couple of minutes um, mm -hmm. about the insurers. If you talk to people in the mountain communities, you talk to people in Denver. Things have gotten a lot worse since Obamacare passed in the insurance world. Okay? In some sense, that's a problem. Some people are better off. Most people are not. Um, my premiums, for example, went up 40% overnight in March because my policy was canceled that I'd had for 15 years. The reason is Obamacare put enormous taxes on insurers. It reduced your choice of insurance policy, and it's forcing insurers to compete in a very narrow fashion. Namely, they've got to control their costs somehow, and the way they can do that, they can't change their plan. The only thing they can do is constrict their networks or make the prices that physicians accept be lower. This is a preview of what Colorado Care will look like. The, the, the solution to this is to free people to go back to negotiating their own terms, explore subsidies like CDOS where you're given money, and if you wish, you can try to negotiate a better deal. Basically, free both the providers and the consumers, to, to, because patients are the ones that understand their care, not you know some bureaucrat sitting in an office um, setting prices. Um, so even with the best will in the world, you may not like the attitude that your particular physician has, and you may need another one. People are different. Their care needs are different. We need a system that accommodates them, not some rigid lockstep thing that's determined by 21 people sitting on the top of $30 billion. So that was the end of our pre-prepared questions. We're doing real good on time, so that's good news. Um, so now it's open up to Q&A from the audience. Valerie, you're not. Valerie, select Valerie select Colorado Health Facility Coalition. Um, I do have, sorry, um, okay. Valerie select Colorado Health Facility You can face the audience because they probably will have a harder time hearing you than okay. we will. Fine. Um, I have one comment in that. Back in 2008, I had problems with me. I had an injury that nobody in the state prepared that the operation was there, and uh, I had private insurance, and I couldn't get it. I had to, you know, so um, it's not private insurance isn't always the best. Now, um, as you know, we have a problem, or as some of you may know, we have a problem in the state where we do not have enough mental health beds. And so that creates a problem where uh, people get put in jail, or in, I mean, they're held in jail. They're not charged with a crime in one hole. Um, the um, governor vetoed a bill that would have extended the time jail at SB 169 um, and established tax cap for mental health goals. But the root cause is that we do not have enough mental health goals, beds for mental health goals. So, what would be the effect of Colorado Care on the availability of mental health beds? Can you repeat the question for our online? So, so the question is, um, there, there's a lack of mental health beds in, in the state of Colorado currently, and what would Colorado Care do to uh, around that issue of mental health beds in the state? You want to go first, Senator? Sure. So I actually am on. Um, 
the task force to look at mental health beds in our state. And in fact, the very first day I volunteered at the Southwest Clinic, I had a patient who needed a psych bed in Denver Health was on divert. Um, and so, uh, you know, we actually are licensing new hospitals every month or two. We are up to 102 hospitals in our state. Only nine of them offer psychiatric services of the 102. So I have a meeting set up with the lieutenant governor because I think the way to address this problem is to say that we're putting a moratorium on hospitals unless they have psychiatric services. And I've had a discussion with the Division of Insurance about whether we might put mental health access capacity onto a requirement for network adequacy for insurance companies as well. You know, this is why you need a, as Ms. Gorman calls it, all-powerful agency controlling everything, because what's being built up now are things that help these healthcare companies get the premium of the healthy person and not the things that help take care of people who need the care. We have this warped system where the people who most need medical care are people who are elderly, people who are disabled, people who have poor social determinants of health because of being held back in poverty, and those are our people on Medicaid, on Medicare. And if you look at what they, providers get reimbursed for taking care of them, it's 65 cents on a dollar for Medicaid on a good day, it's 80 cents on a dollar for Medicare on a good day. My husband from one provider does get $2 for a dollar for patients. So we've created this market-based system that incentivizes providers to take care of the healthy, well people and not take care of the sick people. And this same market-based system is not incentivizing psychiatric beds because it's not about taking care of the health of the population. It's about how can I make money for my shareholders? And so with Colorado Care, the ability to set rules and regulations around reimbursements for mental health services such that, yes, it's financially profitable for them to have mental health services will be available. I, I wish it were true. I mean, the, the current state government controls all these funds. It's controlled you know, about the same amount of funding as, as, as Colorado Care will control. We have no mental health fit. Why do we have bike paths and solar panels rather than mental health fit? Well, because you get more kudos from more people by giving away bike paths and solar panels. Everybody thinks it's neat. We're driven by the same kinds of incentives. It's a politically elected group. There's no particular reason why it should fund bike fit. Um, I mean, and in fact, you could argue that Part of the problem is that government started defunding psych beds, has been doing that since the mid-60s. Why hasn't that changed? And look how long it's taken. Everybody has seen that this problem has been around for 10 or 15 years, and still there's no progress. I would think that you would be better off, um, well, I'll stop there. The other thing is to say that the private sector doesn't have psych beds is just simply wrong. It does, and people pay for it. Go ahead. Um, I'm Tracy Huster, I'm just an interested person. <laughs> um, the board, I understand, is to be elected. I understand the board will set their own compensation. Uh, my understanding, they're supposed to be over hiring of employees to manage the system. What are the qualifications for the board? There's nothing in the amendment at all that speaks to who can, who is eligible to run for the board. Mm -hmm. And but they're going to be over the health care of Colorado. Right. So I do want to remind you that when you have a board of directors, they. So, so the question from the audience is Sorry. around the qualifications for the board and who, who would be eligible to even run to be on this this 21 person board. And if you wouldn't mind, Senator Igota, would you speak to the fact there's an interim board and then the elected board? Right. Yes. So um, there are two different boards of directors. The first is the interim board. This board is appointed um, in the manner that many new laws pass get people appointed by leadership in the House and Senate, majority and minority leadership, and the governor, three people each. 
and the requirements for that board of directors are um, that the appointing authorities make a good faith effort to reflect the diversity of the state and that the board member has to be committed to the success of Colorado Care. And those are the requirements there. And then in the elected board of directors, it's sort of like running for office. If you're over a certain age, you can run for board of directors. So similar to what your state legislators have, which is no specific requirement, it's left to the people. Now so it does. Not need to have any medical background at all. No, because what a board does is just hire and oversee the work that is being done by the people with the expertise and gather advice from people with expertise. So I sit on the board of Denver Health and Hospitals, and I don't know anything about running a hospital. But the people who do come to us and say, these are the three options we have. This is what the pluses and minuses are. What do you recommend we do? And that's the way in which a board is operated. And so this board would have a similar role of being an oversight board it would be other people doing management of the different departments and different functions for the board. So who would be overhiring all those other functionaries? Uh, technically, the board of directors, um, but generally what happens is they hire a CEO and a CMO, and those folks hire the other people. There, the only thing the amendment says is that the interim board, which is politically appointed, and will therefore, you know, they have to be for Colorado care measures, um, sets up the election requirements. There's no age requirement. There's no, there's no requirements at all. It gets to determine who can run, how the elections will be run, when the elections will be held. There's no noticing, and they can have a tax increase election once a year. So these taxes are just to start. Um, so, you know, again, when I say it's an unaccountable board, it's because there's nothing in the amendment that says it has to do anything. And the money, by the way, can't be taken away. If they do a lousy job of health care, you have to amend the Constitution to change their budget. Right. Um, I'm down to the um, Why do you know how this system works for and then also I want to know who's the adjudicating claim. I'm assuming it's not the current health system. So what I hear is lots of jobs and lots of taxes. So if you could comment on that, that would be awesome. So i just repeat the question and make sure I get it right. That the question is how will multi how will states who how will companies who have Functions in multiple states work, and who will adjudicate claims? Great question. Then, if if you, if the health carriers are not adjudicating the, the current ones, to me that means lost jobs. That means lost tax. So, the, to me that means taxes increase, make up, yeah. and are unemployed. So that so I want to just have you address those issues. And the third, so, so just focus on what we're repeating them there. They're streaming it through the internet, and this is the microphone here, so they're not hearing you. Uh, so the third is a question slash comment about uh, concern about loss of jobs and higher taxes if the, the folks doing the claims are, are different. And we'll let you go off first, Ms. Um, Colorado, the amendment says that Colorado Care will pay for um, services if you're not in a federal program, and if you do have private health insurance, it will only pay, it will pay the amount doesn't pay, but the two together can only pay as much as Colorado Care would have paid. So if you have a multi-state employer plan, let's say you continue to insure your employees in Colorado because it's good for getting good employees, you're going to have to pay for um, whatever your insurance plan pays for, but you can only pay Colorado Care rates. Right? So your employees may end up waiting a big long line or whatever if they screw up the prices, which they probably will because nobody can set prices accurately. Um, in terms of taxes, how many companies are going to stick around for a 14.63% tax? Um, you're pulling a heck of a lot of money out of the Colorado economy. Right now in Colorado, approximately 3% of income tax filers pay 33% of the taxes. Okay? 
Those are very, very mobile people. And if you try taking another 10% of their income, they're going to go elsewhere. And the things that are taxed under this amendment are home sales. So if you sell your house, capital gains, you're going to have to pay 10%. Um, royalties, interest, dividends, all of the things and, and your 1040 that normally are income. So it's not going to be good for jobs at all. And the other thing to think about is these taxes are going to percolate through the economy because everybody is going to have to pay this tax. So anything produced or sold in Colorado is going to cost more because the person selling it has to come up with these taxes from somewhere. So if you're in CDAF and you're hiring somebody to do home care, you're going to have to pay that 10% payroll tax as well. So it's going to be expensive for everybody, and it's not clear what we're going to get for it. I think we I think we missed some of your questions. Yeah, I have a lot. Sorry. Oh. So I, I did get multi-state. I did get job loss. I missed the two in the middle. Oh, a June. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So first of all, um, if you are an employer who insures people who are in multiple states, uh, you would, and this would be up to you. You could either continue your current insurance plan and pay into Colorado Care, or pay into Colorado Care instead of your current insurance plan for people who live in Colorado, and that would be the employer's decision. In terms of who's going to handle the premiums and payments and adjudicating, um, that is actually where a lot of the cost savings come from, is by streamlining that process so that a bill is submitted and a bill is paid and not rejected and resubmitted, rejected and resubmitted, and that will be a loss of jobs. Um, the Colorado Department of Labor has estimated, when I asked them how many people work in the insurance industry in Colorado, they said 4,400 in Colorado. There are a lot of people who work outside of the state in health insurance. I know when I call for a complaint, I frequently get a really poor connection with people. Um, and so that would be the total amount in the state. Who knows if that's anywhere near accurate. But there will be a certain number of that still need to happen, right? The main ones that don't need to happen are marketing, um, the price negotiation, and you know the administration of coming up with prices for everything. We have had in our state for a number of years an all-payer claims database which already tells us what is the lowest and the most that is paid for different services all across the state. And so those numbers are known. What creates the administrative complexity is when one insurer has 10 plans and each plan has a different plan price for that provider or that mm -hmm. hospital or whatever. And so yes, those types of jobs will be lost. But just like with Medicaid expansion, this is an expansion in healthcare. We'd anticipate to see a dramatic increase in total health care jobs just in different areas of health care rather than administration and billing. Oh, wait, I didn't answer her last question. So, you know, again, the economic report is available on our website, coloradocareyes.co, and the economist is that with Colorado Care. The cost curve will stabilize, leaving extra money into the economy to stimulate the economy overall. I'm not an economist, so maybe Ms. Gorman will talk about this. But um, as you know, when DU did the study to look at what would the economic impact be of Medicaid expansion on our state, the anticipation was that we would actually have more revenue, more income, and more jobs. And there was a report this year by the Colorado Health Foundation that implied that that had, in fact, happened. And so we would expect this to mimic the increase in coverage that we've seen with Medicaid expansion. Uh, she was wondering if the 4,400 uh, people working in the insurance industry included health insurance brokers. Uh, let me look for the exact answer okay. he sent me and how he categorized people, because I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to misstate. Yeah. And Ms. Gorman, did we miss uh, the yeah, multi Oh, uh, look, if you take 10% more out of the private economy, 
you're going to lose jobs. Um, the problem with the Colorado Health Foundation study um, was that it used the RIMS-2 model. The RIMS-2 model is an off-the-shelf model from the Department of Commerce. And um, it doesn't allow for the fact that in order to get increased Medicaid spending, you have to take more money from people over here who are also creating jobs. So they have fewer jobs. If you have a small business, you want to hire somebody else, you've got to have enough money to give them a desk, a chair, a computer, and pay his unemployment tax so he's productive. If they take your $10,000 that you've been saving for that as part of these taxes, you're not going to do that. And furthermore, if you've got the highest income tax in the nation, you're going to try to get your business the heck out of Colorado. I mean, that's just the thing that logically makes sense, period. In terms of insurance brokers, you know, maybe they'll be hired by Colorado Care because Colorado Care is going to have to do the same sorts of things that insurance companies do not now, only it's going to do it less efficiently because it's not worried about its bottom line profit. Patricia Danson, who's a professor at Wharton, looked at the overhead cost of um, having something like um, Colorado Care in Canada, which it mimics the Canadian system really well, and U.S. private insurance system. She found the U.S. private insurance system, when you include all the overhead, is about 8% of claims. She found that the Canadian system, without even including the cost of waiting lists, was about 45% of claims. The reason is, is that when you collect money to fund premiums through taxes, you affect the productive output of the economy by telling people, don't work because it's going to cost you 10% more, take leisure time, do something else. And so your total output goes down. And that's very expensive. And that's technical economics down in the weeds. But that's why this kind of tax finance is, as I said earlier, one of the worst ways you could design a subsidy program for health care. I found it. I found the um, reference. What he said, uh, this is 2014, um, average annual employment of direct health and medical insurance carriers, so this would probably not include brokers, was 4,400. Um, and then it doesn't include people who work for HMOs like Kaiser, um, because Kaiser folks are also often medical providers. And so Kaiser's total number, or I should say Kaiser, uh, HMOs total, but, oh no, it was Kaiser. Kaiser Health Foundation employment was 7,000, but that's all their employees, not just the administrative people within the system. So that was the number that we got in. And, um, and I do want to reiterate that nationally, an employer spends 13.65% to provide health insurance and the medical portion of workmen's comp. We are changing that to 6.67%. So this is not a new 10% tax. This is a replacement for the current 13.5%. And tied into that current 13.5% is having an HR office and waiting each year with bated breath to hear what your rates are going to be next year. And the projection for 2017 is a 17% increase. So we had a question back here, and then we had one up front. Can we grab him back there? He's been trying his hand up for a little bit. I actually have several. Uh oh. Hey, Mark, since you have a couple questions, and we have to repeat them for the internet, you mind rolling up here so they just hear you? <laughs> I didn't think about that. Yeah. You know, this is the techno game. The first question I have is, is overall, how does this impact spending by the consumer and employers in Colorado, you know, 
are we going to see a gross increase in spending or by getting the insurance companies out in the middle is our total spending going to actually decline because we're not paying shareholders stockholders we're not paying insurance company executives anymore so what's the end result going to be on the overall spending in Colorado? Uh, yeah, I'm first. Uh, yeah. All right. What's your name? So the, um, the analysis done by our economists indicates that in the first year, it will decrease total spending by $4.5 billion. Um, and Mark is correct. The analysis done on a single payer plan in the state of Colorado in 2007 indicated at that time a decrease of $1.6 billion with everyone being covered with a platinum level of coverage. And it is because of that experience that I'm sitting here in front of you today because it made me so angry to know that we could do this, but nobody would. Okay, it all depends on what cost to include in your analysis. What happens in a lot of single payer systems is that many, many can you oh. kind of just talk a little this direction. Sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, it, it all depends on what cost you um, include in your analysis of, of the overall spending. What happens in a lot of single payer systems is that patient costs are ignored. Um, you become a, 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 a cog in the system. In Britain, for example, if you want to have surgery, you're put in a waiting list. And um, if you want to have vacation, you have no choice over what day or time you're going to be operated on. If you don't show up at that date and time, you don't get operated. There's no negotiation. So if you have a vacation schedule, too bad, you're back at the end of the waiting list. Those are patient costs that are never included in these kinds of calculations. They don't include um, you know, changes in demand. They don't include benefits from innovation. And in terms of the stockholders and so forth, well, in this case, you'll still be paying the executives of Colorado for it. And you'll still be paying for a huge bureaucracy that has no reason to streamline the number of people it hires. For example, if you look at computer systems, simple things like that, um, and you compare public sector entities with private sector entities, there's no comparison. The, the government in the US has been trying to buy an air traffic control system for 33 years and has failed every time. Um, Medicare has a very clean claim system to the point where if you simply, and you're a scam artist, and you simply just put the right kind of claim in, it pays it with no overhead. But the fraud in the Medicare system is huge because rings of criminals have figured out how to do this. And because it's not a profit, the for-profit entity, it has no incentive to control fraud. And fraud costs are never included in these kinds of things. So Mark and I wrote totally different minority reports for the 208 Commission. He's on one side, I'm on the other side. And I would just urge you to not just, because somebody says it's a model, we got this, you really have to know what you're doing and think about the assumptions in order to know how good those concepts are. We'll, we'll, we'll try giving Mark short on his last couple, and then we have one question up front and one back. Okay. Uh, um, are, we pro are we capping profits and salaries? both for the people that work at Colorado Cares as well as providers. You know, we've got, there was a recent article in Time Magazine that revealed a, one of the major nonprofit hospitals here in the country had revenues above expenses of $450 million and were paying their president nine and a half million bucks a year. Are we reining that in? Well, it wouldn't be that first. There's no requirement in the amendment that sets any kind of salary for the Colorado Care Board. I think that the closest analog would be look at what happens to university you presidents. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, there's nothing in the amendment that says um, that there's any limit on what you pay people in Colorado Care. It's all up to the board, like everything else. And you should look at what's happening to college presidents' salaries. Um, they skyrocket up because people running it said, well, this guy paid this much, we have to pay more. And so you'll see the same sort of salary spiral here, except there won't be any stockholders feeding on them to show a profit or else um, get your income cut. Senator, are you? So, um, I don't know what to call you in public. Ms. Gorman, what do you prefer? 
Linda? Yeah, Dr. So, Dr. Gorman. <laughs> but I don't there know her baby. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, but she can tell you how to save money doing it. <laughs> so Dr. Um, Gorman is correct. There is nothing in there that sets profits and salaries. Um, and that is at some level in terms of the provider's um, market base. Now what it does do is it eliminates the need for there to be profit, right? So one of the interesting things about our hospital system is that even the not-for-profit system of university operates with a 22% operating margin. Undoubtedly, the prices for Colorado Care would be set closer to giving them a 5% operating margin. So at some level, it, that will be set in the negotiation of rates that are being paid so that we won't be paying them so much that they have a 22% operating margin. And actually it was Health One in 2014 in the state of Colorado alone made $635 million in pure profit. One out of every $3 paid to the Health One system went to shareholders. Um, one comment on that. Um, what makes you think that 5% is enough to keep hospital capital up to date to buy new equipment and stuff? Where does that magic number come from? Think about that. It came from the CEO of a community hospital in Grand Junction. Great. Okay. The, the last issue I wanted to raise, and this is kind of got several pieces to it, and that is protections for the gains we, the disability community, have made, particularly in our health benefits packages through Medicaid. And what I mean by that is, is I've heard that the federal rules, the federal requirements and statutory protections will continue to apply. How many people in this room know that under federal law, the minimum requirement for states on prescription drug coverage is 50%? We pay a dollar to three dollars for our prescription drugs, but that fifty dollar drug could be twenty five bucks and is in some states. So how do we protect against that? Because that's only addressed in rule, not in statute in Colorado. Mm -hmm. How do we protect ourselves from how do we protect other benefits that are optional under federal law? The new dental benefit is a great example of that. Um, how do we um, protect what's the impact on the federal matching funds, particularly on federal matching funds that are enhanced in, or increased federal matching funds for certain unique programs that we may implement? How are we going to protect from negative impacts on all of those? Because to be honest, I don't see it in the amendment. Right. So one of the problems with writing something to be a constitutional amendment is that you write a skeleton and that the flesh gets put on afterwards. And I've been asked before, why is this in the Constitution? The main reason is that in order to not have the revenue collected, subsume Tabor limits. In other words, if we didn't put it in the Constitution, everything collected would count against Tabor and there'd be no money left to run the state government. And that was not the intention. So that's why it was in the Constitution. The second reason is, like, just with Amendment 64, I can tell you this, that I, I don't know many legislators who voted for that, but every one of them knows what's in there and passes laws that reflect what's in the Constitution. And so we wanted to be sure the legislature would be held to the standard of keeping up the benefits required by Colorado Care. Um, Mark, what I can tell you is that I know historically that if um, so if something like this passes and it says, and it must include all this, if all this is here right now, I think there's a quick, easy, you threaten a lawsuit and it's kept the same as it is now. What I don't know and can't tell you is what changes might you have thought in the future that you might have been able to get through our legislature that now there might be a, an argument don't need to happen. But I think what is there right now is easily defensible on the part of the community in court, if it were to go to that point. Dr. Brown, you can walk closer, just. 
You keep rolling away. I know. Nobody wants to sit that close to Mark. But. I've had most of my shots, and I only bite occasionally. <laughs> He's, he's had a really big dog. Right now. Um, the thing you have to, again, I, I'm, I'm broken record by now, not much in the way of protection is in the amendment for you. Even if the statutes are not changed, if Colorado Care were, God forbid, to raise less money than they expect or have expenses that are higher than they project, they will have to start economizing somewhere. And this is a political system in which they are going to aim at satisfying the median voter, not a small number of people who have high health care costs. At least that's what we see in every other system that's like this. So perhaps a miracle will happen and this system will be different. I wouldn't bet my health care on it. So we got a question up front, then we got two in the back and then one in the middle. So thanks, Jeff. Dr. Gordon, I'm here as a parent of a person who has services and is going to even after when I'm not here anymore. And so my question is if you don't think this is a Good plan. What would you suggest we be looking at? What is a better plan? What would you propose? So, so the question is, and, and this one was kind of directed to Dr. Grohman, so we'll start with her. Is if if there, you know, this isn't the right plan, then then what would be the better solution to the, the healthcare problems we have? I've long been a strong supporter of Medicare for people who really need it. I think one of the biggest problems we're facing right now is. Government has expanded Medicare now so that the majority majority of people on it are healthy people. Medicare, hmm? Medicare, Medicare, Medicaid. Medicaid I'm you. sorry. You know, I think it was a plot when they made them so close together. <laughs> Medicaid has been expanded to the point where a lot of people on it are perfectly healthy and they generate payments whether they use medical care or not. So this becomes quite expensive. What that does is it shifts focus away from people who really need help in order to help themselves. And what we're seeing, what we're hearing from legislators already is things like, oh, look at the huge per capita disability payment. Look how few people, they're driving our budget. We need to cut these payments. I think this will be an even bigger problem if you have a single entity trying to cover everybody in the state. You're going to, again, dilute the focus of the country. I think it's a much better idea to focus government resources on people who seriously need help, which is what the Medicaid program was originally designed for. And there are ways to do that. This is not, I think, the best way to do that. Sorry. Thank you. So, you know, I want to talk about what Obamacare was trying to do. What Obamacare was trying to do was, first of all, um, to take care of the fact that there were people who no one would offer insurance to because they were too sick or they were perceived to have a risk. And I would fall in that category now because I'm over 55, I'm overweight, don't tell my doctors, you know, and I'm Latina, so I am at perceived higher risk. So it was trying to keep insurers from discriminating against those people. And it was also trying to help people who couldn't afford insurance to buy it. And so the way it tried to do this was by getting removing insurers' abilities to discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions. And that was the, the main thing that most people remember about the Affordable Care Act. And why did insurers agree to that? They agreed to it because they said, if you do that, that's fine, but please make sure that everyone has to buy insurance, whether they're healthy or not. Because if everybody doesn't pitch in, if only sick people look for insurance, it's going to cost too much money, and we won't be able to afford to pay their bills. And so the way they tried to ensure that was by putting in the individual mandate, which then leaves people with a penalty they have to pay if they don't buy insurance. And unfortunately, or for, that has not worked, because people who um, don't make much money and are healthy can do the math and see that it's cheaper just to pay the penalty than to buy insurance. And so what you see happening is that since the Affordable Care Act, the cost of insurance is continuing to go up. And the way in which it goes up, um, the way in which insurers try and keep that low is by making people pay more first dollar out of pocket. But they've done research plans where even giving people free medical care, there are some people who won't go see the doctor. And by asking them to pay $5, other people still won't go see the doctor. And what I'm trying to get at is that 
there's no good way to decrease total cost because then people don't go see the doctor until they're in dire straits. And then they're in dire straits and maybe they don't have the insurance, maybe they lose their job, and then they end up being paid for by Medicaid and Medicare. And so our current system, remember I said that only one out of five people account for 80% of the spending? Most of that spending is being done by our government already. But we're letting this for-profit industry piggyback on that under the illusion of getting everybody access to medical care. And they're making people with private coverage who are healthy pay tremendously more than they should have to pay just because they're able to make a buck out of it. And so I think we need to get rid of this with, of two illusions. One is that, that we don't want to guarantee everybody a right to health care. Every other developed country in the world guarantees everyone access to basic health care. And the reason they do it is because if you don't give it to people early, you give it to them late and it costs you more, or they become disabled and it costs you more, or they die and you've lost their productivity. And then the second thing is that you can somehow make a value statement around what it should cost for healthcare. Because I can tell you, I've seen patients who, you could say it costs a million dollars. They are gonna sell their house. They are gonna reach out to every relative they can. They're gonna have a GoFundMe campaign. And then when they get totally broke, they'll qualify for Medicaid and they're gonna get that care that they need. And so it's hard to, what market forces when the product you're giving somebody is their life. And so that's why I support a universal health care system. I think the, the concerns that Dr. Gorman raises are legitimate. I think that the, um, the structure of having an elected board of directors that can be rejected and put back in is, um, is a good accountability model to start with. Um, and I think that the um, if you look at the total outcome over time, I think that we'll see more people better taken care of in this type of system because at the end of the day, your bill is my bill, his bill is my bill, my daughter who is dependent on Medicaid, her bill is my bill. We are all in this ship together. And so I, um, I don't see the free market saving this. And you know the last time the government intervened in healthcare was 1964. Guess why? Because insurers wouldn't cover people who were older because they cost too much money. Insurers don't want to cover people who need medical care. So it's a ridiculous idea to offer a product that nobody wants you to use. It, it just doesn't work. So we're, we're closing in on four. So we have two questions in the back and one in the middle and then one over here. Oh, go ahead. So we'll, we'll, we'll let you yeah. in. Uh, we're not timing these real close. Me. So go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, sure, John. Um, so my question is on this on board and the election process. I'm concerned. I want to know whether or not the board would be elected as any political entity might be elected by the people, by people who are registered Republicans or Democrats, or how that would work exactly. I have a concern over the fact that uh, that money drives the ability to win an election so much. And I'm concerned that the population that utilizes healthcare the most has the least money to become electable in that kind of a situation. I feel like it would be disproportionate representing people who have the money to get the healthcare that they need. So to restate the question, the question is around the elections and um, money in politics and, and the, dis the, the disproportionate amount of money that people who need the healthcare the most have the least amount to contribute towards political runs and how these elections would work in relation to other and how the population really looks at people with disabilities as being such a burden. Yeah. And so are you going to elect someone who represents those very people that take money out of your mouth onto the board? Yeah, and so so the the and there was um, about whether the, the population as a whole which the majority of people in the state don't have disabilities, and many of them might look at people with disabilities taking a bigger chunk of the pie. Um, and are they going to vote for somebody who might not support the spending in that manner? Uh, I'll let you go first, Dr. Um, the board sets its own election rules. It's exempt from Colorado's fair election laws because it's exempt from TABOR, and those laws are included in the TABOR amendment. So 
all not it makes up its own rules for elections. You don't have to be a U.S. citizen to vote. You just have to be a Colorado resident. You become a Colorado resident by declaring yourself a resident. Um, and to, and to vote in the tax elections, you have to be at least, and you have to be 18. You have to be at least 18 to vote in the elections to increase taxes, and you have to be resident in Colorado for a year. I have no idea how they're going to determine how someone's resident in Colorado for a year. There's no document you can require to show that. And this is an age of forged documents. So the election requirements, to me, are some of the scariest things in the whole amendment. Forget the problems I have with the healthcare structure. This is, a, this is an out of control government entity. Um, I think we have to be really careful about saying things like the American people don't vote to help people with disabilities. The US has much better disability care in many respects than you will find in some other countries that have universal payer care. Um, I mean, that's one of the problems you run if you jump into the system because of the reasons you talked about. You know, if people are voting and if we say it's a system in which everybody is pitted against everybody else, and it is in the system because this board is required to control per capita health spending. Think about that. That means if you want more spent on your health care, somebody else has had less spent on theirs. That's not the way the system works now. We just spend more if we want to spend more, and we buy fewer sticks of chewing gum and fewer romance novels or something. But, but money keeps growing as medicine can do more for people. That's a very optimistic way to look at things, and people benefit from that. If you crunch everything down to stabilize per capita spending, where's the money going to come for research? Where's it going to come to try new things? Okay. Systems that are organized like Colorado Care will be organized very little innovation. The British hospitals still have wards. The Canadian hospitals have a huge lack of imaging. They're afraid to turn some of their machinery off because with only the 5% profit margin, they can't replace it with So, you know, it's not that people don't want to vote. It's just that you don't want to pit them against one another. You know, you want to leave enough surplus in the system so that people feel like, yes, we should spend a little bit more of our income to help the disabled. But if you take 10% of their income away, are they going to feel like more money to help the disabled? That's a good question. Thank you. So I want to address the election. So it does say elections shall be nonpartisan. It does say that the interim board promulgate rules covering, governing the selection of trustees and the conduct of elections. And this is what I wanted to read. Including rules that regulate campaign contributions and expenditures and the certification of election results. And so it was intended that the election take on campaign contributions and that the, the voting be more similar to a cooperative than a government entity because um, the, uh, the government entities have more actually protection federally around free speech and spending than a, a, uh, a not-for-profit cooperative would have. And so I want to get us away from seeing this as a government entity and that was intentional that you could set up more strict laws around elections as a non-governmental entity because our current system does not provide protections for people. And I actually would agree the Medical Society did, did polling of the general population and there is great support for Medicaid for people who are disabled and people who are blind. Um, I think, um, so I do want you to understand that that's the case, but like with so many things, they support it until it's going to cost them more than they think it should. And so what we're trying to do here is equalize the cost by making it be a percentage of people's income instead of an absolute number. As a state employee, my Kaiser family plan costs $1,600 a month. I pay 400, the state pays 1200, and my salary is $2500 a month. Under Colorado Care my plan would cost $400 a month. I would pay 100, the state would pay 300. And so it is a redistribution of wealth. It helps the middle class people afford a health policy that then gets rid of deductibles and co-payments. Um, but as opposed to the way we're doing it now, which is through advanced premium tax credits that then go to the insurance company, it's putting all the money into a fund whose use is limited to paying for health care and not profit. 
before Michael's arm falls off. Oh, back there. sorry. Wait, <laughs> Michael, one last thing. Um, our health insurance companies don't pay for research. I just want to make that clear. Thank you, John. Um, so, I'm Michael. I'm a CCDC member. I actually had two questions, and they were initially guided to Senator Aguilar, but of course, we're going to hear our help from, from both sides. Um, one is more politically uh, motivated than the other, more disability uh, motivated. When we were writing, the, when Colorado Care was being written up as an amendment, had uh, Vermont Screen Mountain Care already um, collapsed? and what have we done to try to ensure that we did not uh, mimic the collapse of Green Mountain Care? Um, is the first more politically driven question. The second is that I have a friend of mine who is waffling on this because she's um, highly te got highly technical um, needs. Um, an epileptic, I think she requires some sort of deep brain stimulation type support. And I'm not sure um, how those things that are so complex are going to be paid for. I'd like to be able to tell her um, how that's going to be handled um, for this. So, so the, there's two questions from Michael. The first was, um, was uh, Blue Mountain Care? Green Mountain Green Mountain, Green Mountain Care. Care. Um, sorry, wrong color mountains. Uh, was Green Mountain Care's collapse, did that precede the writing and what was learned um, from, from them? And the second question is on, the coverage of more technical, high-tech um, newer devices for people who medically need them, um, will there be assurances those will be provided under Colorado Care? Correct. What's your percentage? So um, Vermont actually did things exactly backwards from what we did. Vermont said, "Let's get universal health care," and they passed the law through their legislature and had the governor sign it. And then they said, "Okay, how do we pay for it?" And when they did that, they found out a number of important things. The first is that they did not get the money from the Affordable Care Act that they had expected in their state when they looked at what the state actually received. The second was that actually, if you think, um, because of where it's located, over 40% of the population went out of state for health care. Um, and then the third was that because they were trying to figure out how to pay for it and everybody was at the table, Everybody found a way to say that I shouldn't have to pay for this reason. So that by the time they got down to dealing with those, they were at a 19% premium. Um, because I was in the legislature, I was able to, um, so we took the national health expenditure predictions for the future for Colorado, and then I took that number to the legislature and I said, um, or I didn't take that number to them, I said to them, what is the amount of money Colorado gets because of the Affordable Care Act? And they gave me that number. And then I said, okay, here's the difference that I need to raise. And how much do we get for Medicaid? They gave us that number. So we took the difference and I said, okay, we want to collect this in the form of a premium. And we want to have it be, you know, two thirds, one thirds. And also, and they went through the details of what income was taxed, et cetera, what was excluded. What is the rate we need to set it at? So we actually started with what is the, the way in which we reach this level of expenditure, collecting the money this way, knowing what money we get in from our state. You know, the second question is harder, and I would agree with Dr. Gorman that there are no specific guarantees. It really, I mean, it really mimics what's required in the essential health benefits under the Affordable Care Act. And what I usually tell people is the most honest answer I can give is that if private insurance pays for it now, then it will likely be covered. But if private insurance doesn't pay for it now, it is unlikely to be covered. I get asked often about like massage therapy or um, herbal medications, and pretty much private insurance doesn't cover those things. And so I would not expect Colorado Care to cover it either. But I don't know enough about her treatment to know is that an experimental thing or is that something that private insurance or Medicaid pays for now? And I don't know that. I, I think Medicaid does, but okay. I don't know for sure. Yeah. Um, one of the differences, I think, in this amendment is that the only thing that can call it off is the interim board. If in the board's judgment, I mean, you read us a second, in the board's judgment, the finances are not there. In, in Vermont, there was an outsider. The governor could decide, the legislature could decide whether or not to go ahead with it once they looked at um, what they, waivers they thought they would get. So that's a, a big difference. Um, 
in terms of innovation, all I can say is that plans that are structured like this don't produce much innovation. Um, people talk about a right to health care. You don't have a right to health care if you cannot somehow get people to work in healthcare fields. If you cut the amount that you will pay or you reduce hospitals to a 5% um, you know, revenues over um, expenditures, what you're saying is we're regulating what kind of attractants you can have to people who come in there. That's one reason you need profits in healthcare. You need to be able to attract people either by, you know, if you invent the next drug, you make a fortune, or if you are very good at what you do, you can make a fair amount of money and run your working conditions at a university or whatever. You need to be able to attract people. What profits do is signal where there are needs in the economy. Why is everybody working on Alzheimer's drugs now? Because if they can do something about Alzheimer's, they are seeing big returns from that. You know, so, so if you get rid of profits entirely, then how do you know who should come in and who should go and where should they work? You're having a government dictate to you who, what should be paid and who should do what. And we've seen how that works out. I mean, go look at Venezuela if you want to see how that works out. So when people talk about a right to health care, you've also got to be able to ensure that people want to do it unless you run a slave society. So we got three more questions, then we'll have to bring it to an end. You let her go first. You're such a nice guy. So, so the question is, um, since Colorado Care, the way the amendment is written, it would not be subject to TABOR. What is the projections, or what are the potential costs in the future to taxpayers? So, it's not subject to TABOR in the sense that the income doesn't count against the TABOR limit, but if the amendment specifically says that the um, premium taxes cannot be raised without a vote of the membership and that at most the board can ask the membership once a year to increase the premium. Right. Right. No, residents who are over 18 and right. have been here for a year. No, no. No, no. All the people. So the ability to raise premium. No, no, it doesn't matter whether you're registered. If you're over 18 and you're a resident of our state. You don't have to be a U.S. citizen to vote on tax increase, right? This is outside Colorado. I mean, I, that's why I stress this point so much. This entity has the ability to raise your taxes without limit, all right, once a year in an election. There are no fair election rules. It could literally decide to have the meeting tomorrow night on Mount Evans at 12.01 a.m. and bust a bunch of people in who will vote yes and you would have a tax increase. It can only do that once, you, once a year, but does that make you feel that much better? Okay. So the good government stuff here is really, really, really important. You're saying that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the amendment, okay, here's what the, the amendment says. You just have to be a resident. You don't have to be a citizen. You do have to be 18, and you have to have lived here for a year in order to vote on the tax increase. There's no way to determine if somebody's been here for a year, and you're a resident if you say you're a resident. So in the middle, and then we got two over here and one in the back, and then we'll probably have to call it at the end because we're already past four. Uh, so do my active duty time and, and retired time. I've been enrolled in military, military health care system over 34 years. And that I'm really happy. I paid for that group and investment for eight years of my life. Is 
so, so the question from the audience is, um, for a disabled vet uh, who is happy with the VA system as it exists, what, what, what would happen, uh, and, and TRICARE specifically, what, what would, what, what's going to happen to vets and the VA system yeah. of hospitals in the state of Colorado? You choose one or the other. No, you, can, you have to choose the Colorado care. If you choose to stay in TRICARE, you pay for both, and Colorado care will pay for that infinitesimal amount that TRICARE yeah, and and, and 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 the other part of the question is is you basically have a choice of you either give up Tricare and only use Colorado Care, or you pay for Colorado Care, keep your Tricare, and Colorado Care only picks up a small piece of that's left over. The Tricare doesn't pay. So what's your percent of that? So um, the amendment actually specifies that it does not affect or change VA benefits or um, Tricare, so those are not affected by this. So your second scenario is true that you would have this and you would have TRICARE. And you would still be asked to pay into or required to pay into Colorado Care. Now, I do want to make sure people understand that as an individual, your first $33,000 of pension and retirement income are exempted. As a couple, your first 60000 of pension and retirement income are exempted. What well, refers to line, um, to Form 1040, line 20, and um, we had our uh, an accountant take a look at it and that was his analysis actually he says it's higher than that but if you go to the website and you'll see the form here this do the math form on the website you can put in your numbers and it'll refer you to the lines in your tax forms as well I did that math and I contacted all about it here mm -hmm. they worked through the math with me twenty thousand yeah. dollars I mean not, it is yeah. up to a certain other amount but it is Twenty thousand, unless you have annuity. Which I don't know. Yeah. Um, look, the tax, and they're not premiums. They're taxes. You have to pay for taxes. The taxes are in the Constitution of this passage. Colorado, by statute, it does tax Social Security retirement income, but it exempts the first roughly twenty thousand, as you said, per person. All right. That's a statute. If the state gets punched for money, it can reduce the amount that it exempts. So you're putting tax in the statute and the exemption is statutory dependent on the state of the state, of the state budget. So you will pay for Colorado care no matter what. Yeah. That's what you have the choice to be in or out with VA premium. As a person who rents also have to choice that right Yes you do. I think a lot of people will look at that and make that choice. So we got a couple more over here, one in the back and we'll try to wrap it up quick. You too, Dave. Um David Wall and um uh, a provider of AOI home care. And my question is concerning uh, my employees. So I've got about half of my employees that, based on uh, an IRS ruling, are exempt from income taxes with state and local. So I'm wondering how that would affect them as well as us as a provider. For those people that their income is, is exempt, the same way for many CDOS clients who so so to uh, restate the question there there was an IRS ruling two or three years ago that exempts home care workers who live in the household for the client they serve, that income from that client is not taxable um, at the federal level. State also. Oh, state, state is also okay. So, so they, they they don't pay income taxes um, right. on, on that they income. Only pay on their how how would somebody like that be handled? Do they have to file W two? Do you do they have to file a W two? Yes, they do. Then they will pay a ten percent payroll tax. Can I finish? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, there are no taxes. There is no federal, other than vacation, sick, illnesses, PTO that we pay. That's the only taxable part that shows up on their W-2. The they have Social yeah. Security income that shows their true income, but it doesn't, those statements do not show any taxable income in most cases. Well, if, if the, the amendment zero. says that you pay a 10% payroll tax on any W-2 income. So if it's zero, you pay no payroll tax. But if it's higher than zero, you will pay a payroll tax, and then the income tax is separate. 
She knows better than yeah. me. <laughs> Sorry. Well, that was an easy one. No. <laughs> Ju- Julie? This is this conversation is difficult for me because I am hearing a lot more specifics from Senator Aguilar and a lot of fear from you that this might happen, this might happen. And I have Medicaid and Medicare, and I remember being referred to as a pig um, because I wave taxpayer dollars. I um, want to know. Um, I think that I I I'm not completely convinced by this, but I am wondering if. Um, back to the mention of the implant, and um, I was discussing the concept of commodification of poverty. There are a lot of people who live their class lives making sure that I'm impoverished enough to get a $48,000 wheelchair. I am wondering if this might be a way to look at being more efficient and effective with how we spend money and look at why I'm referred to as a high cost utilizer. Do you think that this, we have to start somewhere to bend this cost? Do you think there's a possibility that we can look at um, being more effective with how we spend the dollars and efficient with how we spend the dollars with um, having in mind that we, we, we the baby boomers are again, the breaking of baby boomers, you guys are here, we are, are going to be the high cost utilizers. We're the guinea pigs for how this system is going to cut the cost curve. Do you think you see any possibilities around how to streamline care so that it's prevented? And also make sure that people get what they need, and it's not—it doesn't cost so much that someone like myself has to quit my job so that I can pee every day and I can make a wheelchair pee. I think there's a lot of opportunities here, and I'm wondering if we can have some substance as to behind the fear, or some substance as to how this can really help us look at how we bend the cost curve for the whole country as a whole as we're looking at our aging. So I'm going to try to sum Julie's five minutes of question up into 30 seconds. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, Can you make it so uh, we could say yes or no, too? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the question is, is Colorado Care the answer to bending the cost curve and, and making a little more headway on, on efficiency for the high-cost utilizers? Um, the high-cost utilizers, uh, those of us who use a lot of DME, a lot of, uh, a lot of daily need type things, um, there's been industries built around us, and they find ways to make a nice, healthy profit. And could Colorado Care in some way help move us in a more efficient direction? Is that going to pull you, sir? So I actually am going to agree with I know what Dr. Gorman is about to say, which is that we don't know that for certain. I can't tell you that for certain. Certainly the incentives are meant to align in that fashion. And the, um, I think the, uh, the most telling thing in your statement was that, um, that we all know from whatever area of healthcare we interface with that there are misaligned incentives. And the incentives right now are to, I use this, this statement, build a better maze, get a smarter rat. People continue to figure out how to make money in this system and unfortunately, we take this hatchet approach to it, which is what people hate about government health care, where we say, oh, well, now to get a wheelchair like Julie's, you have to go somewhere, you have to see somebody, they have to measure you, they have to do it three times, maybe you have to have fallen ones to get it, because we're trying to catch that one rat who's cheating the system, right? And so the question to me is, by having a closed system where we know what the data is for 5.4 million people, um, and not having to have global, this is in, this is out for everybody rules, can you use that as an opportunity to figure out what are the most cost-effective ways to provide care for somebody that may actually involve paying for some social services? Um, you know, one of the examples that Atul Gawande used in his article, The Hot Spotter, was having someone go out and give someone their medication every day. You know, and I've seen this with hospice patients who then don't die because we do such a good job of providing them care in their home and then they're taken off hospice. And those are the types of models I would hope um, would be incentivized in Colorado care, but it's not anywhere in the amendment. Um, not fear so much as I've spent a lot of my life looking at how systems in other countries work that have the incentives that are set up in 
Colorado Care and Senator Aguilar and I simply disagree on how those incentives will operate. And if we had the time, I could point you to several systems that are set up exactly like this do not, that do not operate at all in the way the Colorado Care Yes people say it operates. We have systems currently, Medicaid and Medicare are a big problem. They need serious reform. Um, CDOS is a great example of what happens when you do a tiny reform. Well, I think it's a pretty big reform, but you know, people I talk to tiny. Just by letting free people spend a certain amount of money that the state's going to spend anyway the way they need to spend it. What I think is fascinating is how the prices in, that people pay in CDOS are, are different than the prices that the state sets for nursing care. What if we could expand that to the entire system? That, you know, you have a choice. You either get a certain amount of money and you follow, like, like auto insurance, you know, you crash your car. You can either take the money and go get it fixed yourself or you can go to the provider that the auto company suggests that fixes your car. You have a choice. It keeps them honest. In these kinds of systems and the kind that's promulgated under Colorado Care, you don't have a choice and there's no way to keep them honest. And unfortunately, there's no fear here in the sense that when that happens, the entity that's supposed to be providing your health care often goes off and does other things with the money, as is the case in Britain and Canada. So that's why you really need to get people empowered, and the patients have to control the funding, not the bureaucracy. So maybe at Chris, is that the last one, or did I see? I thought somebody else had one more. Okay, so, so Kristen, and then we'll come over to Julie, and then uh, we'll give you just a couple minutes to do closing statements on why. Oh, jeez. <laughs> And I I see people burn out quick, so we'll we'll, we'll end the quick. So, so I got a way we can we can tie it all together. We'll jump over, we'll get Julie's question, then we'll come back and give Dr. Garner and Dr. Aguilar each a 30-second soundbite of why. Well, you told us a minute. Okay, a minute. A minute soundbite of why, why, why yes or why no. Um, hi, I'm Julie Perla. I am a volunteer with Colorado Care. And, and there were, and I would like to address your question with my own response. Great. Um, but I first wanted to mention that I looked up the actual wording of the amendment. There were many questions regarding the compensation of the board. And the actual amendment states authorized reasonable compensation and expense reimbursement for the trustee. Now, our governor makes about $90,000 a year. So I can't imagine that the board could justify anything reasonable over $90,000 a year, which the state of Colorado governor makes. So I, I wanted to mention that. And the reason that I support Colorado Care as a private citizen and a volunteer is because I do health care the same way as we pay taxes for education, we pay taxes for uh, fire protection, for police protection. And so everyone uses health care. If everyone pays into the system, we can cover everyone and have a better system. This system is based on wellness, not treating sickness. And I actually would encourage you, I know you mentioned you did the math. I did the math on my situation. My husband's company has a stellar health plan. Uh, it's a 90-10 plan, meaning the insurance company pays 90%, we pay 10%. We have a $500 deductible each. And when I did the math, we saved over $4,000 a year. His employer was paying in 12% of his income for premium. His employer's contribution would be 6%, 0.67%. And so when people have more money, 
they're going to spend that money. And so what Dr. Aguilar was thinking about increasing jobs, sure, there's going to be job churn, but I think in the long run, it's going to stimulate our economy. Companies are going to look at Colorado and say, we know what our health care expense is going to be. It's going to be 6.67%. It's not going to be up to the whim of the insurance commissioner, which this year is 18% increase. And the last point I'd like to make is that there are many prison systems. I don't have a PhD like Dr. Gorman, but I just completed a master's degree in healthcare policy. I also studied many healthcare systems in the world, and Canada and the UK are not the only systems that we can learn from. The truth is, we are the only country in the world that does not provide universal health care. And we can do better. In Colorado, we can do the laboratory for change. Sure, we're, we don't know all of the answers, but this is why I support Colorado. So, no, no, no question there, though. No. All right. Uh, all right. So, so we'll, 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 I guess, go for one minute sound bites. I'll let you know, go first and stuff right there. open. I'll let you choose. Um. Yeah, it works. Oh, oh, you didn't hear any of that. Uh. <laughs> Why don't we, I, don't know, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it was a speech for. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. Well, it's your, it's your, 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 your okay. So, um, actually, they had told me a four minute and a one minute, but I'll give you my one minute, okay? <laughs> Um, so, Colorado Care allows us to put all our health care dollars into a nonprofit Colorado health care fund managed by a board of directors that we elect to represent our interests. Coloradans are the shareholders. This is people, not profits. Colorado Care removes the financial discrimination experienced by people with Medicaid and provides incentives for patient-centered care for our most complex patients. Colorado Care provides everyone in our state with comprehensive health benefits and eliminates medical bankruptcy. There are no deductibles and limited co-payments. It will simplify administration and save patients hours of time and anxiety. Colorado Care will pay good salaries to frontline providers and give competitive reimbursements to hospitals, and it will help it will save us money, and I encourage you to vote yes on Amendment 69, Colorado Care. Can I do a minute? I think I'll do a minute. Yeah. Um, that's a nice dream. That's not what's in the amendment. You have to look at what's in the amendment. What's in the amendment is an unaccountable board that's going to collect 10% in um, payroll taxes, 10% in income taxes, which, by the way, she didn't include for her company that was going to, um, you know, make the math come out so well. You have to include that 10% tax that the company's paying on its profits. There are no guarantees about the kind of care that you will get. In other countries, when you look at this kind of thing, people with complex problems are shunted off to the side because these systems try to please the median voter. They have much less innovation. You can call that fear. I call it simple observation of systems. Um, there, these, these countries like Colorado Care, don't necessarily provide health care for all because they have enormous waiting lists and a large number of people simply die on the waiting list or are too sick to get care once they get to the front of the queue. There are reforms in our health care system that we can do that would make it even better than, you know, much better than it is now and better than in these countries. This is an old style reform that goes back to the 1930s. By putting, giving, putting patients in charge of their funding, we can create a system that's much more responsive to patients. This doesn't do that. This gives an unelected board an incredible amount of money and doesn't even require that you be a citizen to vote for raising taxes from it. It has no accountability at all. Thanks so much. It's been a great audience to this long healthcare policy discussion. And I want to thank both Dr. Aguilar and Dr. Gorman. I, both, for, for folks who don't know these two ladies, they, they are both friends of the community and, and to take the you know, several hours out of their day to come up here and, and present on on some issues that I think, you know, while many of the, the cost issues and stuff come up a lot, the disability specific issues are, you know, we are some of the highest cost utilizers in the state and sitting in this room, and but there's good reason for that. So um, I, I appreciate I appreciate Atlantis for hosting us. Thank you, Candy. Thank you, Jose, for making all the internet stuff work. I don't know how many people we had on the internet, but people were at home watching too. 
Um, so thanks everybody. And Don will hit me if I don't remind everybody that voting is important. You got to vote like one way or another on this and every other issue on the ballot. Uh, if you need help sign up to vote, make sure your voter registration is current. Don knows how or can help you with that yeah. process. So thanks everybody. Thank you. And sorry for the audio stuff. We thought it really worked, and then it turned out yeah. just yelling was easier. Yeah. It just hummed. Yeah. It, it's too fancy of a system. Thank you for coming down. Too many knobs and buttons. Thank you.